Thank you. Let's pray together, shall we? We've got several names on our prayer list this morning, and I know you've got some names on your own heart, but let's pray together. Father, we thank you for answered prayer about Betty Lindsay, Danny's wife, who had a surgical procedure this week, and Father, thank you that that went well, and she's at home recovering, strengthened them. Father, our, our heart is saddened to know that Missy, Melissa Smith's biological dad passed away in Kentucky. And Father, we want to pray that you be with her and family as they travel uh, for that funeral and that, uh, Father, you minister to them and through them and to this family comfort from the Holy Spirit. And our Father, we pray for Jimmy Kittrell, a friend of some of our members who had a bad motorcycle wreck and is in the med. In Memphis, we pray for his healing, and God uh, be with those that care for him. Lord, we pray for Ronnie Kelly as he struggles with chemo, uh, fighting cancer, and God, we pray for his healing in your way, in your will, and we pray, Father, that he would not be so sick, and that, Father, he would not be in such pain. Comfort him and his family. Uh, Father, we pray for Peggy Gladden who failed this week and broke her arm. And God, we pray for her healing. And God, bless her and her family. Father, we're thankful that uh, Ms. Herta uh, is doing well after rotor cuff surgery this week. And we pray for her continued healing, oh Father God. And uh, Lord, I know there are others that perhaps I'm missing, but we lift them before you. You see the hearts of your people here today, God. And you also see on their hearts maybe some personal family burdens, maybe some financial burdens, uh, maybe some physical burdens. And Lord, we just pray that you'll lift those burdens. We pray for our members and our regular attenders who are not here today, that you will bless them and keep them safe and bring them back. And Father, we pray that you will bless this service today as we talk about how important uh, Marigold Baptist Church and every local church is to you, Lord Jesus. May that come across to all of us today. And may we realize to help this church grow is a big thing in the sight of God, not a small thing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, there are two lists back in the back, and I uh, want you to sign up as the Lord leads you. One is a committee list. So you look and see the names of the committee and pick out one you'd like to serve on. And the other one is a nursery list. And uh, so Jesus said, permit the little children to come unto me. And I see Michael Parker back there too. Rebecca's not with us today. Uh, we mentioned this last week, I think, but her grandmother passed away and she's down there on the coast with her family uh, for that funeral. So remember, Rebecca as well. We're glad to see you here today. God bless each and every one of you. Brother David, now are you waiting on Peggy hand and foot? Oh, you do that anyway. Yeah, I do it anyway, but a little <laughs> bit more now. A little bit more now. <clears throat> oh, and it's good to have uh, two of David and Peggy's grandchildren. Three. Three. Hunter's here. Well, I know Hunter's here, but Hunter's here. And Tucker and Macy. Yeah, uh, but Tucker and Macy are from out of town. So I was going to say from Jackson, from out of town. We're glad to have, see you again, Macy and Tucker. Hunter, it's always good to see you. Yeah, amen. Tell your sister hello for us, okay? Let's begin this morning by singing hymn number 12. This is our call to worship. Great is the Lord. Let's stand together as we sing.
about Jesus because he is so precious to me. <clears throat> we'll sing the first, or all three verses actually. <clears throat>
you call that a, a duet. It's a, a four-handed piano uh, a song there. And uh, I'm going to try to convince them to play another a duet with a keyboard and a piano maybe uh, one day. When we can work that out, we can get a keyboard up here upstairs. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I'd love to hear that. I'm going to sing a song this morning. <clears throat> Thing. <laughs> it's entitled, We Shall Behold Him.
just pass out that end there. You got those notes. It always helps when Missy's playing for you too, doesn't it, Brother David? <laughs> God bless you. Thank you, Jan. I really appreciate Jan and John and several of you that have been a real encouragement to me and to Marigold Baptist Church to help our church uh, get its uh, feet back on solid ground again. And I hope many of you, I know some of you have home churches and you may be returning uh, thank you for what you've done for us, and I know you'll continue to support us here at Marigold Baptist, and especially with your prayers. But I, I hope and pray, especially after this sermon today, that if you don't have a regular church that you are attending, that uh, you will make Marigold Baptist Church your regular church. Would you stand, please, as we read God's Word today? It was one of our memory verses. Did you know that Sandy Herta is the only one I know of that has memorized all of our memory verses? We've had one memory verse per month for almost two years now. And so I think the church needs to take up a love offering or give her a gold ring or something. I don't know. I'm just kidding about that. But God bless her for doing that. This was one of our memory verses. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25, and I'm going to reach up to verse 24 because it's connected with verse 25. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider, the word, the Greek here means seriously consider. You know, so many people, and I'm preaching on why we ought to attend church, so many people don't seriously consider, should I go to church today or maybe it's okay to miss today. It should never be something you think about lightly. It should be a serious thing. Why? Because something happens at church. Let us consider how to stimulate. And this word was used for inciting a riot. Boy, we know a little <laughs> about that lately, don't we? And uh, it could be a, an incitement for a good cause or an incitement for a bad cause. And this is an incitement for a good cause. Let me tell you, when you come to church, because everybody has a different spiritual gift, the Holy Spirit lives in all of us, you stimulate and incite your brothers and sisters to do what? He says, to love one another and to do good deeds. Well, uh, we know love is a gift of God, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love. But when you go to church regularly, and you begin to interact with your brothers and sisters, you will find that you have a, a larger capacity for the Holy Spirit to work through you and increase your love. I talked to a guy that came to work on my, something on my house a while back, and he said he was a Christian. He gave a good salvation testimony. And I said, where do you go to church? He said, well, we don't go to church. And I said in, not, in, an, in as nice a way as I could, well, you can be a Christian and not go to church, but you can't be a really good Christian and not go to church. And I think I've got the Word of God to support that. So let me tell you, something happens when you come to church regularly that uh, stimulates and motivates you uh, to love God more, to love one another more, and to let your light so shine with good works. Okay, here's the verse not forsaking our own assembling together. You might say, Jack, now are you stretching this? Is this talking about the local church gathering? You better believe it. That uh, phrase, assembling together, it's uh, one word in the Greek. It's the word they got synagogue from. And as one uh, Bible scholar said in his commentary, he's talking about a designated meeting time and a designated meeting place. Read your Bible and you'll find in uh, 1 Corinthians, the very last chapter, that the church, early church gathered together on Sunday, the day Jesus rose from the grave. It had become a practice as the church grew and matured. That's why it's called the Lord's Day because it's the day the Lord rose from the grave. So he's talking about going to church. And he says, don't forsake our own assembling ourselves together as is the, and I love the New American Standard here, habit. King James says manner, but the Greek word means a habit. 
Have you ever heard anyone, maybe you've said it. Goodness, I've heard it so many times. Uh, visit a church member, they quit coming to church. What do they say? Well, preacher, we just got out of the what? Habit. Well, <laughs> well that can happen. Especially today because there's so much the world will offer you. Hey, stay at home, watch the ball game. I love to watch my grandchildren play baseball, and I mean all three of them. Two eight-year-old twins, one a girl, one a boy, and, uh, and one a little bitty uh, uh, five-year-old, and I would just love to watch them play ball. But folks, I'm just not going to go on Sunday. I'm just not going to do it. Do you know if Christians would take a stand for what's right, we'd have a better nation? We're always talking about non-Christians. Hey, the Bible says judgment must first begin at the house of God. We have so compromised, haven't we? How many of you are as old as I am and remember blue laws? Any of you know what I'm talking about? Blue laws? Yeah. They're on the books. I guarantee you at the courthouse in Cleveland. They're on the books in Memphis, Tennessee that businesses would not open on Sunday unless they were absolutely necessary. Now, we're the only one of the Ten Commandments that's not repeating in the New Testament is the one for the Sabbath day, which was on Saturday with the Jews. But it's still a principle there, right? And I'm telling you, we have dishonored God by dishonoring the Lord's day in this nation. And I'm not talking so much about the world. I'm talking about believers in Jesus Christ. Woo! Stepping on toes today. Quit preaching, started meddling, hadn't even finished the scripture. Not forsaking our assembling together, going to church regularly, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Father, bless the word of God today. Sink it deep into our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Three reasons why you ought to go to church. Number one, because the Lord commands it. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some. That's not a suggestion. That's not a, a preference. That is a command of the Lord. So another way that I could have asked that fellow about uh, that work, came to work for me that I witnessed to, and he said he didn't go to church, but he loved the Lord I could have said, well, how much do you love the Lord? Because Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. So maybe instead of asking you, do you go to church? I ought to just get right down to it. How much do you love Jesus? Hmm? Because let me tell you, if you love Jesus, you love what he loved. And Jesus loves the local church. You know how many books there are in the New Testament? 27. <laughs> Isn't that right, Paul? 27. What am I asking you? Isn't that right, Libba? 27 books in the New Testament. 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament were written to local churches. Yes, the application is to all of us. The book of Romans. There was a church in Rome, the book of 1st, 2nd Corinthians, the church, the local church at Corinth, Galatians, the local church at Galatia, Ephesians, the local church uh, at Ephesus, and so on. I'm talking about half of your New Testament was written, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to local churches. Don't tell me local churches aren't important to the Lord Jesus. They are. Now, we're studying Revelation on Sunday night. I'm excited about tonight. We're going to look at the sign of growing persecution pointing toward the nearness of the rapture, the catching away of the church, the bride of Christ. But in Revelation, which is a book of prophecy, last book in the Bible, 22 chapters, before he gets to the prophecy, what does he deal with in chapters 2 and 3? The seven churches, local churches in Asia Minor, the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, and so on and so on. Yes, it's for all of us, but my friend, 
much, much, much of the Bible is directed to believers, especially directly, indirectly to all believers, but directly to believers in the setting of the local church. Forsake not going to church. It's a command. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you don't go to church, you're going to be out of fellowship pretty much all week long. That's no fun. Certainly not where a child of God ought to be. You ought to be walking in fellowship with the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, and in obedience to His Word. It can either start your week right by going, or it can start your week wrong by neglecting church. Now, I want you, before we leave point one, I want you to look at that word forsake. Forsake not going to church. Assembling yourself together. That's a strong word. This is the same Greek word, though he probably said it in Aramaic, translated in Greek in the Bible, that Jesus used on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Same word. It means to abandon. Don't abandon the church. Now, I usually don't have notes, but I had to have some today because I looked up some statistics. A Gallup poll was taken two weeks ago. It's been on the major news stations. Some of them, I think, just glee about it. Gallup polls have been tracing worship attendance church attendance, synagogue attendance, mosque attendance in the United States since 1937. They've been tracing it. In 1937, in America, 73% of the population went to their house of worship at least once a week, regularly. 73%. Now here's what has made the news from this recent Gallup poll. Today, for the first time since they've been tracking it, The average attendance to places of worship once a week has dropped below 50%. Less than 50%. Now this is all religions in the United States are no longer going regularly to meet in their house of worship. Now George Barna, he uh, was a skeptic. He got saved. He's a brilliant statistician. If you want to find statistics that are always accurate, go to George Barna. You can subscribe to his site, uh, but he's always accurate. Here's what he said recently. During COVID-19, one in three regular church attenders stopped attending church. At this particular time, 32% have not returned. Now, I'm not saying it was wrong to stop assembling for a while because of the danger of the spread of COVID. I'm not saying that. But what did we read? You can very easily get out of the what? Habit. Habit. Now, what they're saying, according, you can read it and look it up for yourself. What they're saying is they've they've enjoyed church online. Many of them have, though, just quit listening to church all together. Folks, it's not the same. He doesn't say, forsake not looking and listening to the church online. He said, forsake not the assembling. Now we all know, and I've taught this since I've been here several times, we all know that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in every belief. But I learned this from Charles Ryrie's study Bible. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, when the Bible says, Know ye not, ye are the temple, that's plural. And it's referring to the gathered church. Now, Jesus is everywhere. He's, He's omnipresent. But He manifests Himself more so in certain situations than others. Where two or more gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. Revelation chapter 2, he said, I walk in the midst of the churches, the seven golden lampstands. I'm telling you, there's something spiritual, supernatural that happens when believers gather together. 
as long as they aren't having a Baptist business meeting. No, that, even that's sweet here. It's been a sweet fellowship here for the last two years, and it's going to continue, okay? So, we are forsaking the church. Last statistics I have, Southern Baptist. You know, Southern Baptist, we are the largest Protestant denomination in the world. You know how many Southern Baptists there are? Fourteen and a half million. Do you know how many attend church regularly? 5.2 million. About one-third of Southern Baptists who say I'm a Christian attend church on a regular basis. He said, don't abandon my church. But we are. See, that's why, that's why Marsh and I were willing to take two years and travel two hours one way to come to Marigold. We love the Delta, first of all, and we love Marigold Baptist Church. They have a special place in our heart. But folks, you know, I've done a lot of things in 52 years of the ministry. I don't know of anything I've done that's been any more personally rewarding to me than be here at Marigold and to see. Not that I've done great things because I haven't. We, through the Lord, have seen great things happen. But to think that we may have had a part in, in keeping the church from closing the doors here and just a little part at the beginning of maybe revitalizing this church. That's a big thing. That's one of the most important things I think we've ever done in our ministry. Why? Because what's important to Jesus should be important to us, and the church is very, the local church is very important to Jesus Christ. Southern Baptist stats tell us, and this these stats were recorded in 2019, before COVID. Southern Baptist church attendance is at its lowest in 30 years. In 2018, because this was done in 2019, Southern Baptist lost 2% of regular church attenders. You know the biggest age group? Youth. College. This is what they said. You can go to the convention site on your computer and see this. Children who are being reared in Southern Baptist life, when they get to college, they quit going to church. That's our biggest area of dropout and loss. Isn't that something? Biggest area there. One Southern Baptist minister said, Even more important, perhaps, than getting new people to come to church, we need to learn how to keep church members from leaving church today. Abandon not the assembling of yourselves together. We ought to go to church because the Lord commands it. And folks, I'm here to tell you, we're losing ground. Now, the second reason, and the last two are very brief, the second reason is my favorite, and I've already touched on it, so I'll try not to re-preach it. It's because of mutual encouragement. I mean, I mean, look at this. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Go back up to 24, which we looked at. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. You encourage. This is the same word. Uh, parakletos, para beside. Kaleo is the Greek word to call. It means to call someone aside to strengthen and help you. It is the very word used to refer to the Holy Spirit in John 14 and throughout the New Testament. He is our divine paraclete. It, it, was, it was a word that was used, in fact, William Barclay good scholar when it comes to language, not much of a commentator. He researched this word and he said the number way, way it was used uh, in secular Greek back during the day of the writing of the Bible, it was, it was used by military generals to rally their troops before they went out into battle. 
through speeches. Have you ever seen how these football teams, before the game, you know, we can do it, come on now, we can do it, go, 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 go out and your favorite team loses. But anyway, that's what it means. See, I, I look at the Holy Spirit as a spiritual cheerleader, and I don't mean to be disgraceful toward His divinity there. But that's who the Holy Spirit is. He is the one God has sent alongside to help us. Now here's what the Bible says. When you go to church, you get divinely strengthened to help you face the week in victory. Boy, I had something happen to me. Here it is at the pastor's conference. I'm not real technologically savvy. If I want to figure out something on my phone, I give it to one of my eight-year-old grandchildren. But let me, the other day at the pastor's conference, I was recording the number of someone that I didn't have, and, and I don't know how this happened. Oh, no, that's not right. So I still don't know how that well, there it is. And all of a sudden, that is a bright light. I didn't even know we had a flashlight on these iPhones. So I'm walking around the pastor's conference, everybody's looking at me. And finally, a friend, a minister of music, David, comes up to me and said, Jack, you know you got your light on on your phone? I said, my goodness. I said, let me get it off. I didn't know how to turn it off. I mean, I'm pushing every button. I know how to push. I said, do you know how to put it off? Turn it off. He said, let me try. And he said, I tell you what, I'll look up on my phone how to turn the light off on an iPhone. And he did. And he said, look at this. Now, man, watch it. Watch it. Yeah, yeah, watch this now. All you got to do is just do this. Ain't that? And that's a bright light too. But you know what I had to do this morning? I had to recharge the battery in this phone. That's right. I mean, that's a bright little light, but I'm telling you, if the battery's not charged up, you know what? It's not going to shine. One of the simplest ways to describe why you ought to go to church is you get your spiritual battery recharged. You do. You do. Okay? Last reason you ought to go to church, he says, even so much more as you see the day approaching. What's that? The day of the rapture. I don't know what day the Lord will come on. He said, no man knows the day nor the very hour. Okay, so don't leave here and say, Brother Jack said the Lord's rapture is going to come back on Sunday. But it is interesting that it, that is the Lord's day and that is the day uh, when they first saw the resurrected. Wouldn't it be something if the Lord came back today and you were at the lake? Now, I'm not saying you'd get left, okay. But I think, you know, he says some are going to be ashamed at, at his coming. Some because they're not saved, but some Christians, because they're not, if it does happen <laughs> on Sunday, you, my goodness, you're not where you want to be. And I'm not saying there's never a reason to miss church. And I'm not saying, this scripture doesn't say you got to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I'd like to say it did. I really would. And I personally just about need to go to church every day to keep my spiritual battery recharged. But it just says you need to go regularly. And I think the Bible speaks, speaks of at least weekly. And uh, I'm not saying there's never a valid reason. Sometimes there is. But that ought not ever be your habit. It ought to be a have to. Not, oh, well, I just don't think I'll go to that. No. Hey, it's serious business. Because you don't keep that spiritual battery recharged, next thing you know, your light's not shining before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. David, you remember Tommy Chandler? Yeah, he was the manager of our rock and roll band. He was so funny. And he had a crush. Oh, Shirley Malone. Yeah, cute little girl. And he really liked her, but, the, but he had a problem. Her daddy was the assistant police chief in Drew. Yeah, big old guy. And he wasn't real crazy about Tommy. But boy, he had a crush on Shirley. Well, one night, the band was riding along in the car. They're a good group of guys. We didn't smoke. We didn't get drunk. 
We didn't use drugs. And we were down, going down the main street of Drew, and Kroger was there. This was when Drew was a thriving little community. And Kroger had left out their watermelons in front of the store on the sidewalk. And old Tommy said, hey, Marvin, stop the car. Nobody was around. I mean, the street lights were there. But is it night? No stores were He said, I'm going to go get one of those watermelons. So old Tommy gets out of that super sport. He goes over there, picks up the biggest watermelon he can find. He starts back to the car, and guess who rounds the corner? Percy Malone. <laughs> the sheriff. I'll never forget. Tommy's standing there, and he put the spotlight on him. Tommy, he was so humorous, he said, would you believe I'm putting it back? <laughs> Percy didn't. I don't think he and Tommy and Shirley never worked out after that. It just didn't happen. You see, I want you to know Jesus is coming around the corner, folks. There are things happening. Oh, they've been saying that for years. But there are things happening now that even weren't in the making 50 years ago or 40 years ago. I'm telling you, I, 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 he's coming around the corner. You better be ready. And if you're going to be ready, you're going to be active in a Bible-teaching, preaching, spirit-filled local church. I'll never forget Jack Hiles, Independent Baptist, First Baptist Church, Hammond, Indiana, told this story and I heard him tell the story. He said one Sunday they were sitting up on the platform back in those days, he and the music leader, and it was about time for church to start, and he said this couple came in, this young couple came in. He said it looked like Ken and Barbie. She was beautiful and he was handsome, and they came in and he preached the gospel. He had never seen them before, and they were the first to come down the aisle. Both of them received Christ. We'll just call the man Max Smith, okay? Both of them received Christ. He said they grew. He said it was unreal how they, they grew and said after a while, uh, they began to teach the youth in the youth department. Youth just gravitated to them. The class grew. He said it was something they never missed. And then he said after a few years, one Sunday, he was sitting on the platform with his minister of music. He said, where's Max? And his wife. They're not here today. Hmm. But they were there the next Sunday. But they weren't the next Sunday. Jack Howell said, but they were there the next Sunday and the next Sunday, but then the next Sunday they weren't there. And then they were there, and then they weren't there, and they weren't there, and they weren't there. And Jack Howell said, The day came that I dreaded. Knock on my office door. Come in, and there came in Max Smith with his Sunday school book. And he laid it down on my desk, Dr. Howell said, and he said, you know, we're just, my wife and I are so busy, and we're involved, and we're traveling, and I'm just going to need to quit Sunday school. Jack Howell said, I begged him, please, Max, don't drop out of, don't quit Sunday school. He said that's the last he saw of him. Not long after that, Dr. Hiles was moved to another church. But as he preached this message that I heard, at this point he pulled out a letter. He said, this letter's from the state penitentiary. Let me read it to you. Boy, this gets to me. Dear Dr. Hiles, please pray for me. I'm serving a life sentence in prison. He said, you may not remember me, but my wife and I used to come to your church and taught Sunday school in the youth department. He said, not too long ago, I suspicioned my wife was having an affair and I followed her and I caught her and the high school football coach in the back of an automobile and Dr. Howells, I shot both of them and killed them. He said, I'll be in prison for the rest of my life. Please pray for me. I've asked God to forgive me. Please pray for me. Signed, 
Max Smith. And then Jack Howell said there was a P.S. at the bottom of that letter. And here's what it said. He said it all started the day I quit going to church. Oh, Brother Jack, you're just being dramatic. I think I've got the scripture to tell you I'm being truthful. There were people, now some have passed on. Did you know there was a time when this church was full? And there are people that we know at one time were suffering the Lord, counting for God. And now where are they? It's a shame where some are. And I want to tell you, one of the starting places is when we stop attending the house of God on a regular basis. So what we're doing here at Marigo is not a little thing. It might be the most important thing I've ever done in 52 years of ministry. And that's why I make this appeal to you. I'll be here one more Sunday. Next Sunday's our last Sunday. But I make an appeal to you. If you do not have a church home, find one. Yes, you can be a Christian without going to church, but you cannot be a good one. You'll never find that expanded capacity of love and good deeds for the glory of God if you drop out of fellowshipping regularly with God's family. Let's stand together and let's pray. Missy, would you begin to play something, please? As we pray today, I prayed before I came over here today, Lord, have the right, have the right people at church today. Please have the right people that need to hear this sermon today at church today. And I believe God has answered that prayer. And you're here not by accident, but by divine appointment. And God loves you and God's speaking to you today. Oh yeah, we'd like to see every one of you become a part of Marigold Baptist Church, but I can't tell you that it has to be Marigold. I wish it would be. They need you. There's a wonderful thing going on here. We need to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, the rebuilding of this lighthouse at Maria. But what I'm saying today is, whether it's here, whether it's First Baptist Cleveland, whether it's Covenant Presbyterian, or any biblically-based church, you make a commitment today. Don't ever forget this message. Not because of me, but because of the Word of God. You make a commitment today. Lord, I'm going to love what you love. I'm going to be faithful to what you've commanded to me to be faithful to. Your church. So Lord, with your help, I will find the right place for me, for my family. And I'll be planted there to serve you and to be encouraged by you through your people. Would you pray that prayer? It's God speaking to you today. Now to be a part of the real church, you have to be saved. Joining the church is not just joining a social club. It's doing something spiritual church is his body, you become a part of that body spiritually when you receive Christ as your Savior. And if you've never received Jesus into your heart by faith, trusting in his death for your sins on Calvary, believing he rose from the grave, do it today, do it now, even now, do it. Lord, I trust you as my Lord. I trust you as my Savior. 
If you're here today and you need to make a decision public, whether it's coming and needing prayer, sometimes we need to come forward just to nail down a stake and say, you know, today God's done a big thing and He's doing a big thing in my life. He's really speaking to me and I think I need to come forward just to, just to say a prayer and nail it down. You need to do that today, you come. God would lead you today. You already know this is the place to be. Some say, well, Brother Jack, I'm not going to move my letter to church not knowing who the pastor is. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit will lead you. Not whether Jack's here or Jack's not here. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us. And He knows who's coming here. So you move your letter today. Come make that decision if God leads you to. In Jesus' name, we give Him the glory. Amen. Let's sing, Brother David. Hymn number 309. Lord, I'm coming home. Amen. <laughs> Good. Benji, would you voice our closing prayer, please?